Well, good evening, everyone. It's nice to see you here again. It's Wednesday night. Uh, well, we're on to, to chapter number three of Ruth. Uh, like I did last time, I'm going to do a little recap, uh, real brief. Uh, chapter one was uh, Elimelech and um, his sons died, and that's Ruth, uh, Ruth's father-in-law and Naomi's husband, uh, made the two of them become widows. So they traveled to Bethlehem uh, because they needed food. They're starving. And they knew that uh, there was food there. They heard there was food there. And then in chapter 2, uh, <clears throat> Ruth finds a, a place to glean. And a man named Boaz's field finds favor with him. And uh, he gives her grace and mercy uh, to her and Naomi through just instructing his men to, to throw down uh, handfuls of the, of the crop that they're, that they're harvesting throughout the, the barley and the wheat and the corn harvest. And uh, then in, now in chapter 3, we come to the point where uh, Naomi realizes this harvest time and everything is coming to an end. Uh, and she speaks with, with Ruth about it. Because uh, she knows that without uh, someone to provide for, her, she'll be doomed. So um, I know these last couple times I've read the whole thing and then I've went through it. I think this time I'm going to just section out some verses and then comment that way. Because um, I'm going to try to fit the whole chapter in this time. <clears throat> so in the in the first set of verses, one through four, Naomi gives advice to Ruth about seeking out Boaz as her husband. Um, so 1 through 4, I'll read Ruth, Ruth 3, 1 through 4. Then, no, then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast? So he, she knows the answer to these questions. But she's telling Ruth, Hey, wake up right in front of you. It's right there. The answer. Your salvation is right there. Behold, he went with barley tonight in the threshing floor. It's a place where they beat the, the barley and, and then the chaff goes up into the wind. Um, it says, Wash thyself therefore and anoint thee and put thy raiment upon thee and get thee down to the floor, but make not thou, thyself known unto the man till he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down, that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie. And thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay, lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And when I just read that last part, it reminds me of a verse, and I don't know, I don't remember where it was. But it reminds me of that verse that says, This is the way walk ye in it when you turn to the right hand, when you turn to the left. It's that, that voice inside your head that shows you, just guides you. And really everything you do guides you to God's word, where it's preached, guides you in God's word when you're reading it and understanding it, and um, just lets you know what glorifies him and what benefits you. Is it the same thing? So anyway, I, I got a little bit off on a tangent there, but like I said before, these harvests and this gleaning that followed were, were over. And Ruth, she just doesn't see the urgency to find her husband. To, to or maybe she just uh, she just doesn't know, she doesn't understand. So Naomi tells Ruth, she wants her to have the security. She told her that in chapter one when she told her to just go away to be with her own family, with her with her former family. She wants her to be taken care of. And uh, Naomi also knows that the law states. That her husband's, her, her deceased husband's next of kin is to provide for her. And this is in De Deuteronomy ch chapter 25, verse 5 through 6. It says, If brethren dwell together, and one of them die, and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her, and take her to him to wife, and perform the duty of an husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead. 
and his name be not put out of Israel. Now this was something they did in the Old Testament times. And this was a picture of how Christ would redeem his people. So they don't do it. They didn't do it after because there's no need. There's no point. Um, actually, the, the Sadducees and, and Matthew confronted Christ about it and brought up this whole hypothetical about how uh, seven men died and passed the wife on to the next and the next. And they asked him, uh, well, whose wife is, he gonna, is she going to be in the afterlife? And he stopped him cold, said, God is the God of the living, not the dead. And uh, they just, he said they misunderstood the power of God completely. There's no point in thinking about these sorts of things if it's a picture of Christ to come. It's right here for us, right for, here for us to understand. So Naomi thinks that this next of kin is Boaz. She's determined to direct Ruth to him. And she's certain that he'll take care of her. Absolutely certain. And this just brings to mind how God gives the people that minister his word, the words to preach in a way that stirs sinners, stirs people that are out in the community, lost sheep, to know that they're dead in sin. And direct them to the only one that can redeem them, Christ. And uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 through 9, it shows this whole thought process that he gives. He puts his, his the people that preach his word through the same thing that people that come to believe. Same thoughts in our minds, everything. Um, so maybe a little bit of a different path, but it's the same destination. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 through 9, it says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. Preaching the law, preaching the Old Testament shows us this. This is how it's shown. Teaching how man cannot satisfy the law. That's why if someone's just focusing on the New Testament and not the Old, you're not preaching the whole gospel. You're not showing the entirety of it. it says, but our sufficiency is of God who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. So just preaching the law, no point to it. Got to preach the grace, mercy of Christ as well. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of, face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. So that preaching of the law is just to show us that we have sin, and we can't get rid of it. But the preaching of Christ returning, Christ crucified, and becoming sin for his people, that's, that exceeds in that glory completely overcomes it and heaps over top of it can't even see it anymore covers it completely so that's the words that god gives his his ministers gives his people to preach it's the hope uh, so then later on ruth follows her advice wholeheartedly does exactly what she says uh ruth 3 verse 5 through 7, five through seven says and she said unto her, Ruth says unto her, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. And she went down under the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. And she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. So this might sound like it could be inappropriate. Um... But it's, that's not the intent. Uh, you'll see the intent a little bit later. But uh, he, he's been working all day, and he just he's tired. He lays down. Um, they have, a, they have a, a festival of sorts when the harvest um, comes around. So he has some food, drinks some drinks, and he just lies down to sleep until the next day. Um, 
just as her mother-in-law said to her to do, she lies at Boaz's feet. And this reminded me of the uh, interaction between Christ and the woman who begged him to save her daughter. She lies at his feet like a dog would lie at its master's feet, waiting for him to take notice. And I uh, just want to uh, read that part to you in Matthew 15, verse 25 to 28. So then came she, this is the woman who just was, was uh, just pursuing Christ and the disciples over and over again, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it to thee, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. So say what you will about dogs. But their loyalty to their master is never questioned, seldom questioned. So this loyalty doesn't come from, I mean, if it came from, from her own mind, from her own sense of being, as soon as, she, as soon as he called her a dog, she'd walk away. As soon as the, the, the disciples told her to go away, she'd, she'd get discouraged and run. She pursued him over and over again and then admitted, yeah, I'm a dog, but I want to eat at my master's table, which is you, which is Christ. So after a person is brought to know their sin by hearing the law, knowing what it really means, and knowing how we fail at every single part, part of it, and their fallen nature, that imputed sin of Adam that everyone has, they, want, they wait at Christ's feet wanting to see him more than one who works all night and watches for the morning. I, I've never personally worked a night shift all the way through. But I know my wife has, and just the look on her face when she comes home, she's pretty excited because she can go to sleep. Um, and she's just, you, you, you can see it in her eyes. As soon as she come home, comes home, that's all she wants to do. She wants to hit the pillow and get some Z's. So in Psalm 130, verse 5 through 6, it says, I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. So reading his word, understanding his word, reading testimonies like Ruth, where they take you through the whole gospel. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. So it's a prayer, prayer of, of people brought to know him. They want to see him again. They want to know. They want to, they want to be brought to... to bask in his glory. So then uh, later in Ruth 3, verse 8 through 9, Boaz takes notice of Ruth and her request for redemption from him. So he, and he pays heed to it. Ruth 8, or chapter 3, 8 through 9 says, And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. So Ruth, in the first place, uncovered Boaz's feet in verse 7 to prepare him, to ask, to, to prepare the, the scene, to ask him to spread that covering over her, signifying him taking her under his care and protection. This is a gesture also of her submission to him. So <clears throat> God, through his sacrifice of his son, spreads his protection or his covering over his people, covering for their sin. This is, it's Christ's blood. It's the covering. So she's asking him, redeem me. Bring me back from my poor, destitute state of a, of a, of a widow who's begging for everything she has. And is almost out, almost through. Um, and Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 8, shows this pretty perfectly. Now when I pass by thee and look upon thee, behold, 
Thy time was the time of love, and I spread my skirt over thee, and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. Covered thy nakedness. First, you had to know you were naked. That's the only reason you'd come. And then you had to know you're doomed. And then it was covered. Covered for you. Not a covering that you made. Not a covering that just came out of nowhere. Christ covered it with his blood. So then Boaz replied to Ruth, um, requ Ruth's request for this redemption. In chapter 3, verse 10 through 13, said, He said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich, and now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest. He does everything. Everything that's needed. Fulfills every part of the law. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman. Howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. Tarry, tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning, that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman well. So he's telling her that there's, a, there's another one nearer to her in kin. Let him do the kinsman's part. But if he, will do not, do not, if he will not do the part of the kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of the kinsman to thee. And as the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. So he tells her, it's going to happen one way or the other. <coughs> if it doesn't happen with the nearer one, you're still covered. You're still safe. So Boaz's generosity and knowledge of the law is shown perfectly. As he sympathizes with Ruth, tells her, I know that I see the way you act. I see the way you are. You're a virtuous woman. And tells her also that he knows God's law, knows it perfectly. He knows what what uh, what Naomi knew too that he that the next of kin is to to care for the widow in need in her time of need. This shows that when a sinner is brought to the whole by the Holy Spirit to know Christ, when he's turned to the right hand and turned to the left, or she takes no, Christ takes notice. Because he fulfills the law on their part. He knows them by name. And he does everything that is required of them. Fulfills the whole... I mean, the Ten Commandments isn't the whole law. It's just the part that was, was brought out in one, one part of, of the Old Testament. And, it, and it's, you know, it's fairly lined out. And it's shown that man can't satisfy it. No way. No part of it. But there's more. There's so much more. And Christ fulfilled all that perfectly too. For you. So in Matthew 5, verse 17 through 18, it says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. He did it all. Every single piece. And he's the only one that could. There's none other could do this than Christ himself. In Isaiah 63, verse 5, it says, And I looked, and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was, there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury had upheld me. Christ, by his own hand, by his own work, brought salvation to his people because he earned it for himself. And he passed it on by his blood, by his dying for his people. He didn't deserve it, but they did. All his people did. So then comes uh, the next part, Ruth's departure from Boaz. So she thinks, I'm covered. Everything's great. Now I can go. I, that's all I need. Well, wait, there's more. Ruth uh, 3, 14 through 15 says, and she lay at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before no one could know another. And he said, Let it not be known that a, that a woman came into the floor. This is the one I want to kind of focus on. Also he said, Bring the veil that thou hast upon thee, and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley, and laid it on her. 
and she went into the city. So that veil that she brought with her, that covering on her face, she laid it out and he gave her food, more food, more provision, more grace. Filled it with six measures of barley. Now, I don't know what six measures is, but I'm sure it's a lot. Um, so Christ, this shows Christ removes the veil of tears that we have, that we come with to him, and he fills it with his grace. Over the brim. In this, God takes our current trials that we have, oh, that, the, that trail, or that, uh, that veil of tears that, that we carry, and through, his, through Christ's faith, turns them into grace and glory at the hope of Christ's return. So in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 7, it says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. So all these, all these things that happen in our lives, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So at his return, and that looking forward to it, is the grace and mercy that God gives through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So then Ruth returns to Naomi and tells her all about everything that just happened. Um, verse 16 through 18 says, When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? She told her all that the man had done to her. And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me, for he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Then said he, Still, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know... Or, I'm sorry, then said she, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall, for the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. This part was, the, that last sentence was, was the off, most awful part, I think, of the whole chapter. He won't rest until it's finished. Won't rest at all. Um, and it just reminded me of all the interactions with Christ uh, talking to his disciples talking about how you know they should be in prayer and then they fell asleep and then he's like wake up you should be in prayer christ didn't rest throughout his whole life his whole ministry he still doesn't rest until he brings his people to salvation brings them to redemption ruth tells naomi all that happened between her and boaz giving it showing her that gift of barley Naomi answers Ruth, telling her Boaz will not rest until she's redeemed. She knows it. And this, this testimony itself showed me nothing will stop God's plan for each one of his people. Everything from it will come to pass because it sets into motion the next thing that he's planned, and the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. Um, Christ says in his, in his prayer, let thy will be done, Father, not, not mine. It's, it's a great prayer for any of us. Let thy will be done. Because his will is what is in our best interest. We may not see it at the time, but it'll, it, it happens. It happens for a purpose. So the book of Ruth is an awesome example of showing this. Ruth, the Moabitess, as the great... I don't know, a bunch of greats probably, grandmother of Joseph, Christ's mother's husband, the man that took care of Christ's mother, was born out of the incest of Lot and his daughter. So Genesis 19.34 shows us, It came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him, that we may pervert, preserve seed of our Father. And if you look back at the other, uh, the other uh, people in Matthew 5, verse 1 through 7, there's, there's a lot of questionable things that happen there. There's a lot of people who are not perfect. People who did things that were wrong. People who are sinners. Brought to salvation. And... Uh, so this shows how God brings light out of darkness, Sh shines forth light out of these people who are not at all perfect, Pro pretty much the opposite. And uh, just like 
he brings those who believe his word out of those who do not, by the faith of none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, shining forth out of his people. Because there's no other way it could. So in 2 Corinthians verse, or chapter 4, verse 3 through 6, it says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. So the people that aren't meant to hear it, aren't meant to know it. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So he shines unto them and they just reflect it back. It's not coming from them. It's coming from him. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servant for Jesus' sake. If I got up here and talked about myself, it would be a waste of time. Complete waste of time. Other than to say, I'm a sinner. Brought to salvation by the one and true, the one and only true Christ. And it was by no merit of my own. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in your heart, in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So this word that's before you, this word that's preached three times a week, is to just shine forth the light that God gave to us. God gave to his people. Not because we deserve it, just because he chose us to receive it. So um, just to kind of wrap all this up, uh, in the beginning, Ruth didn't see the urgency, didn't think it was important. She just kept doing what she was doing, kind of going through the motions, like a lot of us. Um, life just kind of takes over. You go into autopilot. and You don't see the importance unless you're brought to see it, unless you're brought to hear it. Uh, preaching of the sin of man and the inability to to wash it away. So Naomi tells her she has to go to the feet of the one that can redeem her. God's people don't know the urgency of their need for Christ until they're shown that someday that gleaning will come to an end. Someday that stuff that you're scrounging for every day is not going to be there anymore unless you find your Redeemer. So Ruth, like God's people, caused to seek out her Redeemer, ask him to spread his covering over her, and waited for him to respond, laid there until the morning, to hear what he had to say next, because he was going to instruct her what to do. Matthew 7, verse 7 through 8, it reminds, reminds me of the ask, seek, knock. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find it. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. All of these actions are spurned by the Holy Spirit within. That voice in your head saying, this is the way I walk you in it. When you turn to the right hand, when you turn to the left. When you turn to the right hand and turn to the left, you're doing it because you think you should. But the way is right before you, straight line, right to Christ's feet. So Boaz's response was more gracious than Ruth could ever expect. She just thought, I'm going to get up in the morning, I'm going to go home, and then I'll come back and he'll do what he says. But he takes that veil from her and fills it with six measures of barley. Double grace, taking sin away and adding grace for her. Christ does this for his people time and time again, showing or taking away their shame and replacing with his glory shows her or shows us through his word how it happens um, and it, and just clears our mind of all the other procedural junk that we go through every other day, every day from from the beginning of the day to the, to the end uh, working by the sweat of our brow to feed ourselves Isaiah ver, uh, chapter sixty one verse six through seven. I think shows us pretty well. It says, But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of, of, your, of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye, boast, shall ye boast yourselves. For your shame ye shall have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. 
Therefore, in their land, they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. So Christ is the one that gives us everlasting joy, takes away the shame, and just replaces it with grace more bountiful than we can imagine.